but it's the same sort of thing is what do you want to be known for standing out for that uh, as a brand as a personal brand as a business brand as a non-profit brand um, standing by that and watch you know and and then creating content around whatever that is you stand for so people get a good feeling for who you are and what you do and I think the the problem is you can't be all things to all people now because you'll just disappear into the, the noise Well, welcome to Power to Speak, the podcast, and I'm really honoured today to have guest Trevor Young with me. Uh, Trevor, you are PR consultant and content marketing strategist, but you are also, in terms of the networking that I do over here in the UK, you are a, a bit of a, a, a content marketing guru to our, our particular network. You are the media. So welcome. You are more than welcome here. I'm so very happy to have you. Thank you, Jackie. I'm glad to be here. And it's earlier morning where you are, but I'll, I'll stick with my uh, <laughs> nice little dry rosé because it's night here in Australia. Oh, and I'm, I'm a little bit jealous, even though it's only 11 o'clock in the morning here. I've got my coffee, but yes, yeah, it won't be. It won't be. I'll give it a couple of hours. I'll be on the wine. Okay, uh, sounds good. But yeah. But Trevor, I mean, you just have had such an amazing career to get to where you are now and doing the 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 everything that you do and along the way you've been a journalist uh you know I think you started out blogging you are now an author a speaker tell me a little bit about how I, I mean it's obviously a, a big question how did you get here <laughs> but well, tell me maybe <clears throat> maybe how it all started for you what did yeah. you want to be when you grew up a, a spy ah yes look I think that um, I used to read James Bond and all of those sorts of books at, you know, around 12, 13, 14 years of age. So writing and reading was very, very much ingrained in me from those early days and imagination and, you know, uh, coming from the country, you know, you know, there was nothing else to do. So you had to use your imagination on a lot of things. Um, and, and I think that, but writing was always the thing that's the through line doesn't matter what I've done it's there's been a, a massive writing element to it and I, I do recall I do remember um, taking a freelance writing course when I was about 16 and that was in the days when uh, a, a correspondence course they called it Jackie mm, yeah. and it came in the mail <laughs> <laughs> and you did your little exercises and you sent it back. And um, and there's some, some people who are younger probably thinking, what is the mail? And, um, <laughs> and But that led to getting a, a job with a, uh, a regional country newspaper. And then from newspaper, you go to another newspaper and then from newspaper to and journalism to public relations. And I think while I've been in public relations, I've always tried to push the boundaries of what PR and communications was all about. Um, so I did a course in advertising and direct marketing. And then kind of when it came to the mid 2000s and I got sort of hooked on blogging and starting a blog called PR Warrior, which continues today. I published an article today. Um, and that was in <clears throat> mid 2000, coming up to whatever that is, it was July 2007. And that kind of changed everything for me because all of a sudden going through the gatekeepers as a PR person and through the editors and the journalists and all of a sudden you, you know, you can create your own online publication, very rudimentary in those days, but you could still do it. And that just changed everything for me. So I was uh, I was on LinkedIn in 2005, um, yeah. and in that early days, if you asked anyone to connect with you, you were definitely seen as a stalker. Um, but and Twitter on 2007 took me about six months to work out what the heck Twitter was, and uh, but it was that combination of things. It was more the Twitter and blog, <clears throat> and then I was heavy into that. And what happened is that that got me onto small panels and meetups and that and then that grew into uh, bigger speaking gigs and then I was you know on national TV and national press and people wanted to know what this social media thing was about so it was very early days of social media and I kind of played an educational role and then that that changed everything because at that point I was um, co-founder of a, uh, a PR and brand communications agency and we'd been running it for 10 years 
and we'd sold it to a publicly listed company. So then from that point on, I left the structure of a company and kind of ran my own thing around social media a little bit too early in hindsight. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and I've really been in content and social and PR and comms and joining all the dots since then. So yeah. um, along the way, as you said, a book um, with a publisher called Wiley, which is one of the biggest business book publishers. And, you know, I did 50 talks for nothing, hated the concept of speaking. And I know you help people. I wish, where were you in my life <laughs> going, going back 10 years? And, um, and after 50 talks, I got an agent, an agent happened to be in the audience. And from then I actually started getting paid. So everything's just sort of evolved gradually uh, over time. And, um, I don't do agency work now. I don't do the consulting where I do the work. And now I coach and mentor and help others and teach and help others to do it. So yeah. um, slow evolution, but continued uh, evolution. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It's been great talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much in there. Let's, let, let's. I want to go back to the journalist side of things mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. and also I just with the correspondence course that does kind of take me back I mean I've just finished an open university course over here which is obviously all kind of online and it's but I think it, that's how it started it was all you know bits of paper mm -hmm. in the mail and you know you fill in your you, you did your, your stuff and, and posted it back but where did you grow up in Melbourne were, were you I, I say you're in Melbourne now were you in Melbourne then no, I was in the country. So I've always been a country kid and uh, my dad was a bank manager. And in those days, bank managers would move from town to town or within the city, but he, he didn't, he uh, didn't want to be in the city. So we were always going from country town to country town. So I was going from school to school to school. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's um, you, when you're in the country, you have to learn to do things a little bit more and uh, um amuse yourself because there was nothing else unless you, I played sport but apart from sport and school there was nothing else so you had to sort of uh amuse yourself a little bit more and yeah. uh and that's what we did but I, I was lucky because we lived in the bank which was in the main street of a town called Warwick Nabil people can look it up go and google Warwick Nabil and you'll see you'll see that google Scott Street Warwick Nabil and you will see where I lived because that's the main street of the town and we lived in the bank at the back, up, up top and behind the bank. And uh, next door was the newspaper, the Warwick Nabil Herald. And <clears throat> I, I went to sleep with the, the rhythm of the printing press, wow. um, uh, which was which was interesting. And then when I got, uh, you know, my teens, then I, I got a job there. We folded newspapers. <laughs> we literally got them off the press and folded them. And then someone would cut them with the guillotine. So, uh, I mean, that was the way newspapers were printed for many, many, many years. Um, and so that was my, I, I guess, literally, I had ink in my veins from that point. And, yeah. and then when I was still at school, I, I sort of did freelance writing. I wrote a, a music column for, the, for, the, for that newspaper. So I had an in and I became a cadet what's called a cadet um so a cadet journalist so i learned on the job whereas probably today that doesn't happen you go to university and do three or four years and then try and get a cadetship or get a job at that at that point uh, i walked in um as an 18 year old and the, the editor said i want a back page lead in 25 minutes and i had no idea what he's talking about so <laughs> that's how you learn yeah, <laughs> that's you the fire. Yeah. and you and, and the good thing with being in the country too on a newspaper is you have to find your own news because um it, when you get into bigger newspapers you have a, a chief of staff and they'll tell you this is what you're doing today uh but there you have to fill the paper and um, you know, after a year and a half or a year or so, the editor said, okay, well, I'm going on holidays. And as he's walking out the door, this this newspaper has never not been published in X amount of years. And uh, so as a 19, 20 year old, I was the editor for a few weeks and nothing gets the heart pumping like a, a big empty page and you're on deadline to print. So yeah. deadlines, I guess that's all part of it. That's all part yeah. of uh, yeah, and, no, it, and, and PR. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a big part of, uh, of what I do too, deadlines. Yeah, I have to work through a deadline. I mean, I was going to ask you why you wanted to be a journalist, but, it, you know, from from what you've said there, you've, you've painted quite an evocative picture of going to sleep with the rhythm of the, of the you know, the machines going, printing through yeah. the night. 
So yeah, I can imagine that is uh, ink in the veins, definitely. It it shows me, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and is there? I mean, I, there's something in journalism, I think, around stories, and and again, it's it's social, isn't it? You know, you think about how you then went into social media. The stories that are, that you have to find as a journalist, you know, is is about people and it's about life. That's so, right. You know, you have to make phone calls, you have to go to the pub, you have to be part of the community to ingrain yourself to find out what's going on. So it is networks, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's networks and, you know, getting people to tell you a story or give you a quote or, hey, do you know such and such? And, um, you know, those things, are, uh, they're ingrained in you early and um, they're, you know, I always say I'm a former journalist, but are you ever a former journalist? I mean, are you ever... You still write. You still understand a story. You can still do all that, and and it's a good skill. It's I'm I'm lucky that I got in an industry which was a good skill for the next industry, yeah, uh, and which in turn was a good skill for where I am now. Yeah, I mean, it, as you said, it is an evolution. It feels like yeah. you know it's it, it's evolved from from that sort of correspondence course into a newspaper, and then into the blogging, and then into journalism. I mean, it just is that that kind of progression it is i had i had once like an 18 month like in my early 20s an 18 month diversion from this media field media and comms and pr which was into adult learning uh and adult education and that was still in the country and a different country town and i just wanted to give um uh, writing a bit or journalism a bit of a, a break and try something that came up and try something different and it's funny now I'm going a full circle on that way because I'm about to launch a um, like a, a an online uh, digital training uh, academy and I'm going back to learning and teaching and uh, so the it's not that any any of that is necessarily planned but it just evolves and and I'm lucky I'm in industries where things do happen and take yeah. place but you've got to also push yourself i think that um i think a good aspect of being um a, a writer or a journal and or a journalist is curiosity and i think you feed your curiosity and i've had that from a very young age and so i'm still curious i'm still curious yeah. and that's that's what feeds evolution i think to a large degree because you you're pushing boundaries and you're curious about something yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always remember the, uh, the the learning platform that you came along to for you are the media, and it, it was about putting your flag in the in the sand kind of thing, yep, or yep. flag in the ground. Flag so how ground, how yep. yeah how have you done that? How 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 is that kind of yeah? You know, it's probably for me more more philosophical around communicating your brand, whether it's personal brand or business brand, and how you want to um, deal with clients and customers and um, build an audience. And so the flag in the ground there is about, um, or I've actually superseded that. I still say flag in the ground. Know your colours to the mast. Um, but it's the same sort of thing is what do you want to be known for, standing out for that uh, as a brand, as a personal brand, as a business brand, as a non-profit brand, um, standing by that and watch, you know, and, and then creating content around whatever that is you stand for. So people get a good feeling for who you are and what you do. And I think the... The problem is you can't be all things to all people now because you'll just disappear into the, the noise. So if you stand for something and, you know, you could be quite hard edged about an issue or a way to do things or it might be, you know, multiple ways of thinking within the broader sphere that you operate in. And together that tells your story, your narrative. So I guess in effect standing for something or flag in the ground or colours to the mast or whatever it is, it's about it's about saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. Uh, if you like the way I go about my business and how I think about things, you might be a good fit for my business. Uh, because I get, I think too many businesses try to appeal to everyone and you just can't do it. Yeah. It's too hard. I mean, you look at Apple. Apple, one of the biggest brands in the world. There's a lot of people who hate Apple. You know, they've got a flag in the ground. They know exactly where they're going. And by going hardcore down one in, in that direction, they put off everyone else who wants to go in that direction. So it can, it, it works for a single person. It works for some of the biggest brands in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I love as well that you sort of talk about the fact that we are all our own media companies. Yep. 
Yeah, and obviously, I, as, you, yeah. as you say, with Apple, they they have kind of cornered their market, and it's like you you listen to them on on every single platform. So mm. yeah. Yeah, look, I think the whole thing about being your own media company, and that, again, stems from 2007 and blogging, and it's still, you know, to this day, it blows me away that I can sit here, you know, at a kitchen table, and I can create an online, a global online publication in, you know, within 15 minutes, I can create a, you know, a global radio show, a global TV show, like it just still, still gives me goosebumps just thinking about the opportunities there that are afforded to us it's just it's uh, there's a there's a saying by a guy called Richard Edelman who runs the world's biggest PR firm after his own name it's called Edelman and he talks about you know uh, influence has shifted from the hands of a few to the fingertips of many and I just love that and and so from 2007 and that, that early days that's when I started thinking about you becoming a media company and you know there's a I'm not the only one to, to say that, but it's it's been my mantra uh, for all that time. And if I said, look, I've I've got one thing to say and one thing only amongst all the things that I do, it's a the, the central point is you can become your own media company or media channel, build an audience and deal directly with them. And from that will grow your brand outside of your sphere as well. Yeah. Um, so that's probably been the central point since, you know, 07, 08. And that yeah. doesn't change. The things around it change, the technology changes, the apps change, um, the audience change, consumer behavior changes. But at the end of the day, is that still getting involved, creating content that's interesting and relevant for a particular audience, growing an audience through social and your content and the myriad ways is still the way to, uh, you know, to get out. And from that, by building that media brand, as it were, it's, you know, it'll help your business. It might help bring in opportunities that you didn't even know existed. Uh, partnership opportunities. I mean, I've, I've had opportunities come to me that I, I didn't know would existed and they've kind of come to me. So just by doing stuff and being involved and proactive, which Mark Masters and the crew from your other media, I mean, that's what Mark does. He gets out there and does stuff. Um, things happen. Yeah. Things happen. But if you sit in a corner and don't do anything, nothing happens. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, though, as a, as a small business owner myself and being relatively new to the content marketing side of things, it does feel quite overwhelming. I mean, how, how would you recommend people start i mean where where should they yeah. start yeah it's it's a really good point and I, I really feel that because i deal with people who are starting and um they there is a degree of overwhelm and part of my role is to uh try and reduce the amount of overwhelm but at the same time be passionate about and enthusiastic about all the opportunities um Look, I, I, I tend to take people through a, a, a process, a planning process without trying to overcook it, but I take them through a process. So step by step, they start to see the picture and they they understand things before they get to the content. Because the problem with content and all the channels and all the things, it's really easy to do stuff. It really is. You can start tomorrow and you can go nuts and I'm all for experimentation. But eventually you'll hit a brick wall and or virtual wall <laughs> and you'll get overwhelmed or this is not leading into anything or whatever. So I really do advise people even step back and say, well, what do I want to achieve? What's my, I know a lot of people don't even want to set goals. You know, they hate the goal setting thing. People are either a goal setters or not. Um, but just have that little bit of a, I call it an aspirational anchor. What's that lofty ambition that you're, you're after? follow that path that at least gives you some direction and then really look at your audience and and who are you trying to appeal to and what's of interest and relevance to them and um because i think content is like a venn diagram one side it's how you want to show up in the world and and your message and what's important to you and i think most marketers get stuck there that's where they stay it's all about them and the intersection of the, the, the other corresponding um, circle on the Venn diagram is what's of interest and relevance to your ideal client or the audience you're trying to attract. And your audience is not necessarily just a customer, but who influences those customers as well. And so you've got to try and find that kind of sweet spot, um, be something that represents who you are and what you stand for, 
but also will appeal to to your audience. And I guess the, the key then is you can the easiest the easiest way to start, and this is without even getting into the mediums, because that's the problem. People say I've got to be on YouTube. Well, why do you have to be on YouTube? If you start asking the question why straight up, you won't actually go off and make these rash decisions until you, <laughs> it'll force you to think about it. So um, the thing is, don't even worry about the modalities uh, or the mediums straight up, but think about that audience and, and the type of content you want to create. And where is your audience hanging out as well? So, you know, you might hate video. Well, if you hate video, don't do video. You, If you might be a writer and I don't want to talk, well, then don't do a podcast. Um, we look at, you know, Mark and your other media started with a started with a, a newsletter well actually started with a blog but the newsletter fell out of the blog but usually the best way is to start with something and not necessarily dominate it but master it and then move on um, and if you can start building a, a, subs a subscriber email subscriber base for that content early which is something i didn't do um, and which i did um, then that's not a bad thing as well yeah. Do you do you recommend people um, get people in to do their writing for them? And I mean, or do we need to show up personally? I mean, it, it, it seems to have changed slightly in in the yeah. Different of, of well, again, if you're looking at writing, and 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 this is where it does get interesting. Why I mean, you stay on, stay on something, but I, I think the thing, the, the secret, not even it's not even a secret, but the the big thing today is about repurposing the content so you might you know if you're going to do all the effort to create a really good long form you know article a nice piece and it's a really strong idea but then you can you know you can turn that into a a podcast and you can film that at the same time and you can crack it open and turn it into micro video and put it all over the socials uh, but that's getting a little bit more advanced and a little bit more sophisticated in your content repurposing but you know, I'm a big believer in in the written word, regardless of whether you do video or podcasting, because it'll come back onto a blog anyway. Now, if you do do a podcast, then you can, of course, you can um, transcribe it and ditto with the video. Well, with the video, people are going to watch it. But uh, if it's on a website, they'll probably watch it, whereas people don't really listen too much on a website. But I, I still like the written word there because, you know, there might be some SEO juice, but it's this body of work that you've built that people can go and check out. And people take content in different, consume content in different ways. We've got to be aware of that. Um, they Some like to write, some like to watch video. Unfortunately, some like to listen. So we're, we're lumbered with that if you want to get a broader reach. But, I mean, with words... The, the key is to have the idea and the power of the story. And if you're not a good writer, there's two ways to go about it. One is you just put it out in bullet points and headings, and that's about it. As long as you've got the general gist of what a, the narrative is of the story and the hook, and this is what I want to write about, and this is the advice I'm going to give or um, the statement I'm going to make through it. And then get an editor, like I call it a sub-editor, um, others call it a proofreader. Um, I know Americans tend to call them proofreaders. It's really, um, I call it, just think of an editor and someone who has sub-edited on a newspaper before and on newspapers you have the writers and you have the sub-editors. The journalists aren't necessarily great writers. The sub-editors are the gold. They're the ones that make them good, make them sound good. They take their work, they yeah. fact check it, they sharpen it up, they cull words, they put the heading on and they, they add a, you know, a coat of paint to it. So the journalist often is only, you know, putting the undercoat on and the, the, the sub editor will put the, the other on. So I were uh, not for my stuff, but with my clients, I put all my clients work through a sub editor and someone who's been on all the big newspapers here in Melbourne, uh, who's English and lives here now. And um, he just tightens it up and improves it. And so I think that that's a good, good way because also, if people are perfectionists, they'll never finish. They'll never get yeah. it done. And it's a real limiting belief and a roadblock. And so I think a good way to do it is this. And I'll tell you even a bit, I hate to use the word hack, if you can tell me another word to use. Another uh, way to improve this system is I've got a lot of clients. Most people will tell you if they're busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I can't, I haven't got time to write it. And, you know, they might not be good writers and it might take them a significant amount of time to write something of note with a bit of meat in it. 
And so what I've done in the past is with people like that who, you know, I, I'm i lucky all my clients now, they're credible people with lots of information in their head. My job is to get it out. So this is where going back to the journalism yeah. days, my skill now is not necessarily writing it, it's to get the story. This is a good story. Let's grab it and to ask the right questions to get the story. So I record it on Zoom. I give it to rev.com to, uh, to transcribe. Uh, I use the human to transcribe, not the AI, because the human is much better. <laughs> and that way I don't have to touch it. And then I, I uh, ping it to the editor and he writes the story from there because he's a journalist. So uh, if you look at the, the client in that regard, I spoke to him for 40 minutes and had three really top line articles out of him um, just by asking him questions. And that was his own work. It was yeah. his, the spirit, his ideas, his heart, his spirit was in that article. Um, so it wasn't ghosted, you know, you get people who ghost write and they didn't even have anything to do with it. Um, that's not, I'm not a believer in that, but that's a really good way that cost effective way to get really good information out there in a professional way. Um, so even if you haven't got someone to ask you the questions, you riff it, record it into, into Rev, which is an app, get it back, give it to an editor, you're done. So it's, it's a terrific way to do it, I think. Um, and uh, and that's a good starting point for someone who doesn't want to write, who doesn't want to get yeah, caught yeah. up in the whole writing thing. Yeah. No, I, I enjoy writing, but it does take me forever because, you know, as you say, as a perfectionist, it's never quite right. Um, but the thought of handing it over to anybody else is like, you know, handing over a baby, isn't it? Well, Yeah, it, it, it is hard. Um, but again, what's the goal? To get it out? Or... Yeah. So yeah. there's so many options, so many ways to go. And I think the issue people face now, I, I, you may have used the word earlier, but overwhelm, well, you did use the word overwhelm. Yeah. And it's what content to write, where to write it, how to write it. Is it writing? Is it, is it web? Is it what is it? Yeah, all of that? What's the frequency? Um, and then once we do it, how do we get it out there? Because it's about, you know, now 20% of creating the content, 80% of distribution. So there's all of those things. And then you go, what tools do we use? Which way do we go? How do we do this? Like it's, it's hard. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I've internalized it because I've been going through it. But so what I try to do and what I'll try to do in my courses and that coming, you know, that are coming down the pipe will be to simplify it as much as possible. But I think where people get tripped up is that they get hit with Facebook ads and Instagram ads. This is the way to do it. I'll make you a YouTube superstar or a podcasting star or come here and we'll do these templates and you'll have, you know, a hundred leads in 30 days and all of that crap. And, and, it, and they're persuasive and they write great copy and it's really easy to get sucked into it. And, and uh, I've, I've tested a few of those things and they're really not that good. And, yeah. and the problem is it may have worked for someone, that blueprint. It may actually have worked for them in the, in the good space. Um, others, they're probably a bit dodgy. It may have worked for them, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for you or me or anyone else. And so my key thing is, um, my message these days is, you, I, I want to give people the tools and the ideas and the confidence to plot their own path. So there's kind of some rules, but look, if we meander off, that's fine. We've got to find your own path. What's going to work for you, your brand and your goals, because you are unique. And to just follow someone else's uh, blueprint blindly, you know, good luck. If it works, you might get lucky, but that doesn't mean you don't go deep into YouTube or anything like that. What it means is you think strategically, you understand the lay of the land, you get confident and then, oh, okay, I'm going to go into live streaming. That makes sense for all of these reasons. Tick, tick, tick. Just thought about it. Then you go deep into, I'm not going to teach you live streaming. I'll teach you 10% of live streaming. Um, and then if you want to go deeper, you can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of a minefield, and I just wonder um, that sort of first step is it is it about sort of, is it about getting in your head who that audience is? I mean, I I, I hate that word avatar, but hmm. you know, certainly from what I do when I'm working with people around uh, a presentation or a talk, for me, it's always telling that client it's not about you, it's about them. So it it, it 
there is something in finding out what it is that your audience are going to take from what you can give them. You know, what, what is it? So is that, a, is that a good place to start? A hundred percent. It's a hundred percent. It is, uh, Jackie, because, you know, it's about relevance, isn't it? Um, they've got so many options and opportunities to look at other things and getting people's attention and being on their radar is the hardest thing. Cutting through the noise, getting on their radar, getting their attention, you have to earn it. You can't buy it, you have to earn it. You can bludgeon them with ads, but good luck with that, it'll be expensive. You've still got to earn it somewhere along the line for sustainability stake. Um, and so the only way to do that is really to understand them. Now, in the, the pure tradi I'll say traditional content marketing space, um, it, it really is around pain points and challenges and issues that people are facing. And I think that's always a really good place to start because most people, if they're in business and they're in a smaller business, they understand their client or their customer really, really well because they're on the ground. They're, they're close to them. And, you know, I get people to say, well, what are the top, 10, 25, doesn't matter, um, challenges, issues, pain points, um, niggling questions, you know, niggling questions they've always got that they've never really got answers to. And if you can just create content around those things, those six things, 10 things, whatever they are, doesn't matter, video or whatever, doesn't matter, um, then that's a start. You're off and running. You're already doing what most of your competitors aren't doing already. That's a win. That's a win. And so I call that utility-based content. And this is where the PR hat now comes on because then, okay, well, how do you differentiate your brand? So a lot of experts get focused on that utility, the how to do this, how to do that, lists, all of that sort of stuff. And it's good because no one ever went wrong being useful and helpful. Unfortunately, now that space is getting really crowded and to be seen as an expert in your space, it's just getting a little bit harder to differentiate because there's a lot of experts out there. doesn't mean it can't be done, but it just means that it's it's harder today than what it was five or six years ago. Um, there's an opportunity then to do what I call leadership content. And this is about, you think, or thought leadership content. This is about trying to move people with your ideas or change the way they think about a topic or an issue. And that hurts. You know, that could be research or understanding trends that are coming, you know, from from overseas or, you know, having insights. And so what you're doing is you're connecting dots for people. And sometimes what you tell them or what you're putting out there in content actually might not be useful and helpful. It might actually scare them and might get them angry. It might prov you're provoking thought, it might be a contrarian view that they don't like, but at least they're going to listen to you. And, and you look at the good, well, you've got Mark Schaefer coming down to the UK soon. Um, he's a classic example of, of, I think, a genuine thought leader. You know, he's, he's, he very rarely will do a sit, he'll give you a lot of ideas and how to do this and that, but he's not really the utility how to. He's, um, you know, when you look at his classic uh, content shock article of many years back, which uh, went viral, and it went viral because he was contrarian, uh, had a contrarian view, was provocative, um, it, it, it ignited debate and, and um, sparked conversation in a lot of circles. And that's great thought leadership content. That's the stuff that gets shared and will build an audience and of like minds and people who want to be, you know, part of that tribe. So it, people will be, it doesn't mean you can't do one or the other. I, I always use Joanna Penn. I don't know if you know her. She, she probably lives near you and she lives in Bath. And Joanna it runs, a, she, she is a writer. I love the fact that her, I love the irony of the fact that her name is Pen, P E N, -N, -N <laughs> and and her her persona online is the Creative Pen. That's her website and her podcast and everything else. And and she is a fiction author, but she's a non-fiction author, and her non-fiction um, books are very how-to. So she she does do a lot of how-to. But then she's also very much a thought leader as well uh, because she talks about AI in the publishing world and she's my go-to resource for anything self-publishing and becoming an authorpreneur, which means building a business around your writing. And she, uh, you know, she'll talk about AI and, and different models of uh, um, Web3 and, you know, new publishing models and stuff like that. So she's at the forefront. So you've got someone who can then do both. So, but people tend to fall in one bucket or the other. There's no right or wrong. It's again, 
Uh, are you a teacher on an ex deep expertise or do you like exploring ideas in public? People will, will often be one or the other. Yeah. So how do you see yourself? Where do, where do you sit in that? Because obviously you've got the podcast, you've got the blogs, the writing. You do a lot of speaking now and, and obviously yep. the book. Where, where do you sit in, in that kind of? Yeah, look, I do, I do do how to, but I've never done as much of it. I've, I've probably eschewed that a little bit. Um, and, you know, no one, I don't call myself a thought leader, but I like the whole idea of exploring ideas and putting them out there and seeing what comes back and, and layering upon layer and joining dots. I think I've, I've just naturally done that. I've looked at all of this stuff in a review mirror and said, ah, that's what that is. And tried to, put names to it and turn it into a model that people can understand. And whenever I sort of take people through that model, they, oh yeah, I get it, like it makes sense for them. So it, it, on one hand, that's kind of educational, but I'm probably veer more towards the ideas and, 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 you know, pushing boundaries of thought in some areas and coming up with concepts that, you know, may not have existed and, and putting it out there, floating them and see what people think. So I'm probably more, in line in that um i'm less less likely to you know the five best ways to become a podcast host that's you know i i don't think i've done that one <laughs> i might have <laughs> but i don't think i have i may have done a little bit of utility content and i've hopefully provided utility within the construct yeah. of, a, of a of a sort of a thought leadership piece and i'll just yeah. add just onto that just in case people think there's all this other content um there's a part of that which I call human content, which is the the selfie, the behind the scenes, the stories, interviewing other people like this, um, you know, and, and and telling other people's stories. So the humanity, I think, is really important, and that's a good way to differentiate yourself. Take people behind the scenes, and you know, get a little bit more as I say, open the kimono and uh, give a little bit more of your story. And then there's the the branded content, which is more your promotional stuff, which you don't want to go more than uh, more than twenty uh, percent. Yeah, I mean, it, it just interests me then as as doing what I do for a living, which is obviously shape helping people shape their talks and their presentations. How do you start a keynote? I mean, how do you start in in your own preparation? Do you write it all out? Do you are there sort of stories in there? How do how do how to work how does it work for you jackie you would be a guest you would be <laughs> a guest at how i do it um all right so i'm someone who's always hated speaking so going back way back i've i i, I hated it i d disliked the, the, even the the idea of it and earlier days i was running an agency and i was known in marketing circles um, and I'd go to a marketing conference and talk on things. And if it was a case study, that was okay because I knew it better than anyone else. And if it was a topic that I'd pitched and it was a good idea and, you know, something about marketing to Gen Y or whatever it was in those days, then I'd have to do research. And, and, and on stupid occasions, I would go, I'd script it and they were the worst thing. So I've learned my lesson early days, you don't script anything. Um, and if I'm doing a big keynote, I might script the first two sentences and that's about it to get me going. Um, I, when I do a talk, it's often, I can't roll the one out, unfortunately. You know, it's not as if I've climbed, climbed Mount Everest, I'm just going to give this lifestyle talk of blah, 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 because that's not it. It's usually I'm brought in to talk on social or content or, you know, connecting connect um, you know connecting through content uh, for franchisees or um, financial planners and that's the sort of stuff that I get and often there's small business people under a bigger umbrella and so often when you're a keynote speaker in that space at conferences and that you're actually a bit of a uh, what do you call it you're a bit of a um, Trojan horse for the message of the organisation. <laughs> so that takes a bit of a different dent because you've got to then weave that in. So I've got elements of my talks that do come together, but I pretty much go and, um, depending on who the audience is, I don't roll the same thing out. I go and see who's, who might be in the audience and who's doing stuff well and then highlight them. Uh, or I'll find allied industries globally of who's doing something well. So I try, I more than theory, I try and show practical examples. So 
the only problem with that is I've got to internalize those examples. And so most of my preparation will be around that. Uh, if they're not examples that I'm using day in and day out, there's some examples I use all the time and I probably know them better than the examples themselves uh, because they've never even stopped to think about it. Um, so yeah, it's it will be a case by case. I'll take the brief and then I'll look at that brief and I will write from scratch, but I will take elements of what I've done before and then I'll add fresh stuff always because there's usually a different kind of spin that's required for that. And it's funny, most, a lot of the talks are, oh, we need a social media talk and da da da. And when you dig a bit deeper, it's not about social at all. It's about communication. Yeah. And, um, and then once they get that, then you've got an open slate to drive it the way you want to drive it. So I find that good, but it does mean a lot of preparation. Yeah. But uh, you'd still be a guest at the way I do it. It's, uh, but I do try and tell stories. I do. I, I use examples and I tell stories and I use my own self as well um, as much as possible. Uh, that's a story at least I know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I try and challenge them. I try and give them things to do. Now, that's a keynote, which is, you know, that you're paid to do versus, you know, a meetup where you get up and riff on it a sharper topic and you know yeah. you have a point of view or a panel which you know as long as you you know your stuff you're pretty right in that you don't want to be i don't think you want to be too prepared in that stuff to be honest no no i, I this this is where people get bogged down sometimes is they have so much information in their head that they think i should script it i'll put it all down on a piece of paper and then i'll memorize it and you go like, oh, well don't do that that's never going to work no uh, it's uh, yeah. and I, i've learned that and and it's really and you know what it's really hard to memorize two minutes let alone a bloody Absolutely. whole you know, 40 minute keynote because the problem is and this is what will happen you'll forget something and then you're yeah. stuffed yeah that's yeah. terrible it's terrible so i did that once and i it was it was just a stupid decision but um i think what's really good though is if you have that you found your lane and your point of view and you've evolved your story and your message over time and you might even create your own lexicon over time but you'll create your own stories you'll see things in blocks and buckets and you'll tell that story so often anyway over a period of time that it will become de rigueur is that the word yeah. de rigueur <laughs> uh, without an accent and and you'll you'll know it it'll just roll so if yeah. i go back and listen to a, maybe a podcast i've done i was oh did i do any good in that and i'll go and have a listen i'm sitting there saying i know exactly what i'm going to say before i say it and i'm it's right because you you do internalize and you do the more you do it the more you will have these hooks and flavors and angles and and fr and and ideas and stories that come out but you've got a you've got it's a muscle isn't it you've got to work that time yeah. and time again mm. it is and that's you know that's that's a great reason for using your own stories which a lot of people are reluctant to do sometimes but you know your own stories you know you you've lived them so you're never going to forget those so. And you can embellish. You can embellish. Yeah. No one really ever <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do. I do get my. I catch myself repeating the same stories, and that always kind of feels like, oh no, I shouldn't say that again. But actually, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know how you feel about that. You're sort of no, and I think it's the same with a, a message or a story or a narrative. That's the spirit of it. It's not rote. It's yeah. not by rote. And you could tell the same story three or four times, and it'll be different potentially every time the outcome will be the same but the way you tell it will be compelling and the more you tell it the better you know it the more you can give it a yeah. bit of energy and flavor um so oh, i'm okay i'm okay with that and it's it's funny there's a thing in pr and comms that you know if you're if you're so sick of something saying something it might just be getting through <laughs> yes. and we we you know and I've been guilty. Of, oh, I can't write this story again or rewrite it in another way or take another spin on it or whatever or use this case study. I've done it to death. You actually haven't. You know, most people never saw it the first time around anyway. Yeah. So and, and those that did, it's a good reinforcement for them. So it's a, it's been a really good lesson to learn that. Um, and that's now one I impart on my clients because, you know, people need repetition to even 
even take note of what it is you've got to say. Yeah. I don't shock horror. People don't listen to what you've got to say. They don't read your stuff. You, they need repetition of message like seven or eight, nine times before it'll even sink in and they'll trust it. So yeah, uh, it's a real, it's a really good thing to get our heads around. And I can, I also will, will just say this bit. If you've written a book and, and all the, all the publishing guns will tell you, if you've written a book, be prepared to talk about it ad nauseum for at least 12 to 18 months. And yeah. when you've written it, you are so heartily sick of it. <laughs> and that's probably when you're ready. It's ready anyway, by the time you're really sick yeah. of it. But then you've got to talk about it for another 18 months. Yeah. Yeah, you you have this um, these uh, singers that, you know, like the, the beat, um, Paul McCartney was on Glastonbury and he sang all the old songs and you kind of think, he must be sick of those. And and you do hear of artists say, well, I'm not going to sing that song anymore. But the audience are just baying for, you know, for, they want to it. hear it. They want those stories. They, you know, they, they know what they like. Talking of books, let's have a, I'm going to put up uh, your, your book. So here we got uh, content marketing for PR, how to build brand visibility, influence and trust in today's social age. So is that, t tell us a little bit about the content of that, Trevor. Yeah, well, I, I wrote this because, um, you know, there's a lot of the people who are loud about content marketing or, you know, they, they go they go down a certain path and not what they say is wrong, but it, I think it's it, it sits over here. And, but coming from a PR background, I, who's been doing content, you know, 20, 30 years, I mean, my first thing in PR was newsletters, <laughs> albeit we printed them. Um, and the, you know, the deadlines were a bit longer. Um, but I, I, I always felt that I was taking a different tack and because yes, there's content marketing and all that stands for, and that's all good. And you know, the utility stuff, but the thought leadership and the human stories and the connection and all those things that are forerunners of, of marketing. I believe PR is a forerunner of marketing. PR, by the way, is not just media coverage. That's just one small part of it. Every bit of communications is PR. Then what about if we looked at content through a PR lens? And so this the book's all about that, um, you know, building trust and visibility and cutting through and and you know growing your sphere of influence over a period of time um, and so the first part of the book is all about setting the scene and the second part's more about you know going through all the elements of blogging and podcasting and and how uh, owned media which is your blog your podcast your youtube channel can lead to earned media which is the media of relations side of things the editorial coverage um, you know getting onto other people's podcasts etc that's a yeah. i call that earned media and that's probably been pr's remit and so what you're creating from an owned media perspective needs to flow to be consistent into an earned media and that's when you're getting double bang and then you chuck mm -hmm. social media over here and you've got the three uh, kinds of media working together in a consistent fashion which gives you a greater leverage yeah um, and and in in making this book, did you did you have some anxiety over the typo typography? I know, <laughs> I know you. I know you're a bit of a typography geek. Yes, <laughs> I love I love terms. I love my fonts. I love uh, I love my fonts. Um, there's a there's a website called Creative Market where you can go in and buy so many things, but you can buy fonts. And I can lose myself for hours uh, looking through hundreds of fonts, and I end up buying fonts that I never use. But I've got them there for one day. Um, I had a. It's amazing. I I did I self published this one, so my the book before that was called Micro Domination and that was through Wiley. I self-published this one and it's it's amazing the infrastructure around you, around writers now to self-publish. Like it's scary how sophisticated it is from people uh, being able to design the covers for the, and these are people who design covers for the best in the world at big mm. publishers. They're now all freelance. Um, there's, you know, editors, um who same deal they've 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 got all the they've got the chops they've got the, the the track record with um with major publishers you can pick one that will suit you if you go through a publisher you have to pick that you have to use their cover designer you have to use their editor but when you when you do it yourself you can um cherry pick there's a there's a um an online marketplace called reedsy uh, -E -E and they have vetted 
um, suppliers for all of the aspects of publishing your book. So I had a great cover designer. And, and one thing I learned from Wiley is when you sign the deal for them, the first thing they do is get the cover done because you pin that on the wall and you get you excited and keeps you motivated. So when I decided to go with content marketing for PR and I decided on the name and the blurb and everything, which kind of sets a direction for the book, um, then I went and got the cover done straight away. So uh, mm. a designer from London and she was great. And she gave me a lot of great ideas. <laughs> Funnily enough, um, she had so many, too many ideas actually. And, and I got it down to two and I put the covers side by side and put it up on a post on LinkedIn. I said, look, I like both of these for various reasons. I'm erring on one side, which I won't tell you about, but what do you guys think? And I got 70,000 wow. views of that. It went off the charts. And of course, everyone has a say. And yeah. it was almost 50-50 on them. I can imagine. <laughs> so With that I amount of people, it's going to be. It didn't kind of help me at all, but I kind of knew which one I was veering towards. And it was, um, I thought this cover itself was a little bit more interesting. Uh, the other one was a little bit more obvious and funnily enough, the obvious one would have stood out better on, you know, on Amazon and on a phone, but nah, I'm not the yeah. guy. Oh, give me something that's, you know, going to be a little bit more interesting. Yeah. And, uh, I, it just took me a little bit, whereas the other one was pretty, pretty basic. That basic doesn't mean it's any, it's not bad, but it's, uh, I've, uh, but that, that was the process I went through there. And then I got an editor from New York. And she, she'd she done work with Gary Vaynerchuk before, who was someone I'd read his books. And so I used her. And uh, and then and then there is the the publication. And, you know, the, the, the strategy then is do you go all in with Amazon or there's other other suppliers? We won't get into that now. But then you make a decision. I go to Joe, Joe Penn, Joanna Penn. What does Joanna say? Whatever she says, that's what I do. Yeah. And that's what I did. And um, and then about a year later, I did the um, the audio. A mate of mine's a, uh, a an audio engineer who does audio books, produces audio books, and I spent a few days with him, and we we uh, knocked out the audio version. So all of that is done from my desk at home. It's 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 that's amazing. amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. And it took a bit longer because you know I'm going to be lenient on myself yeah. you do it through a publisher the first one book was lb this one was about eighty thousand words the first one i got up to i needed at least forty five thousand. i got up to 60 and they dropped it back to about 50 um and i had three months to write that and even two weeks in i still didn't know what i was going to write i'd sold them on the concept i still didn't know what i was going to write oh, so that that, that there's a lot of pressure around that but the pressure was actually not in the writing the pressure was in the editing and I wasn't appreciative of the editing stage and I did it pretty quickly over a two to three week period. And the thing is with edits, we're not talking about grammar or anything. They're talking about, we'll rip that part out and we'll add new things in there. And when you go back to it, you're actually almost rewriting it in your own head. Well, I've, I'm, I've seen these mistakes now. I'm going to redo it and uh, perfectionism. And, and what happens then is that they'll say, look, if you don't get this, they give it to you in batches. If you don't give me this batch by Friday, there is no book <laughs> because I won't reach my deadline and you certainly won't reach yours. So um, had I probably known that, I probably would have cribbed a couple of extra weeks on the writing. Um, so the pressure was right up at the end. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it wasn't fun. Well, you know, I, I wonder what point you have to get to. I've just done an ebook, which is, <laughs> I say an ebook, and that's not what I mean at all. It's kind of a, a resource. So it was only like two and a half thousand words. So tiny. Um, but then you kind of go, well, I've done that. How, at, the, at what point do you go, well, I have enough information now to write a book? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, that's where the, the idea has got to be big enough and there's a lot of dots to join, I guess. Um, I mean, if it's a how-to book and you know your topic and you're going to go deep into the how-to and preferably it's a how-to book that is reasonably evergreen, otherwise you're going to be bloody changing it left, right and centre. Maybe that's a good strategy. Oh, we got the updated one and the updated and the updated. But I, I think the book kind of almost, it doesn't write itself because that sounds tried. Um, with both books but particularly the second one it was there and it came out in me like it it almost demanded to be written because I thought about it every single day and 
as I started sketching the notes down, once I'm a little bit more of the sketching it out, but not really planning it, super planning it, because I want to leave a little bit of flexibility. Um, and, and so that kind of, but once I could see it in totality, and, and it's really just the chapters, what's the flow and of, yeah. of the whole book and the chapters and what needs to be covered and how much research will it be done? And once you get, if you can get to that point, you know, that's not even how many words, I don't even, that's not even an issue. It's really just getting into it. So from that point of view, it kind of rolls itself uh, naturally. And there's nothing wrong with small books. There's nothing wrong with a 30,000 book, you know, 30,000 word book or, a, uh, or a, even in hard copy. I think that, you know, you don't want them any bigger than what they should be. Yeah. You know, if you can do a book in 5,000 words and package it nice, people love the packaging of it, um, then that's fine. You know, I think that that's, there's, it's worse. And I know that maybe publishers have been accused of this in the past. They fluff up the books to make them bigger so they can put them on the shelves when they really were quite light on in the first place. Yeah. So to my mind, it's better to do a thin book that adds value and people can read in two hours and get value out of it and have an impact and they actually take action. That's a better result than something that's padded out. Yeah, I mean, the other, the, don't want to go too deeply into how you write a book, but I just, I'm, I'm really, my dad's writing a book at the moment and he is up against that kind of, do you self-publish or do you get a publisher in? And, but he's kind of feeling that to publish himself is uh, is not going to do his ego any good. He would rather a publisher come in and and, and take it and do that. What what would your answer be? Uh, that's a good one. That having gone through both, look, when I first the publisher came to me, so that was nice. Um, of course, that was nice, and of course, I said yes because I always wanted to do it. So I always wanted to be in airport bookshops. That yeah. that was that was the number one. That's what a publisher can do. They can get you into an airport book, bookshop. And it was great to go to the airport and there's the book, blah, 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 take a photo, put it on Instagram. That, that was all wonderful. But the, the key is if you want to, <laughs> this is what the, 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 the wisdom now, and I totally am on board with this. Um, if you want to make money out of a book, you self-publish because you get virtually all the royalties. <laughs> um and and nowadays you don't have to it's not vanity publishing it was vanity publishing when you had to do a run of two or three thousand books at the printer and they're still sitting in the garage that was vanity yeah. printing so that that i don't even know, hear that phrase anymore but that's what self-publishers used to be uh um you know sneered at to do yeah um so that that is not there anymore so you know, your dad is in the wrong vein. That is not there. That vanity publishing is not there. It's not considered that anymore, uh, because some of the best pub, you know, some of the biggest authors in the world self-publish because they make more money. They make a hell of a lot more money by doing it themselves. And and so there's that side of things. If it's about credibility in the eyes of other people, then yes, having it in bookshops and having a um, a publisher behind you, particularly one that's known in that industry, whatever there might be a niche that he's in, then yes, it's a perception game and that's good. Most publishers today will make you buy 500 books or whatever anyway. So you're out of pocket straight up yeah. and then you have to sell them to make that money back. And But, but if you self-publish, you don't need to buy those books because they're print on demand. So people can buy them and they print them, Amazon prints them or wherever um prints them on demand so you can still buy a bunch you know cheaper but you know it's it's not as incumbent on you uh to do that yeah. and so yeah so if it's about making money and being in control which are two good things then self-publish if it's about um you know credibility and yes i'm with the publisher and all of that then you go with the publisher and but then you got to get the publisher to take you and that's yeah. not easy because they ain't going to take you unless you've got a platform yeah and your platform is your blog and your audience and your social channels and everything like that your collective audience over all of those channels is your is your um is your platform yeah so you know 
it might be an educational piece or a textbook, I don't know. That might be a bit different, but as a general rule, they want you to have, because they've got no marketing departments anymore. Mm. You know, they'll, they'll help you. Well, they have, but it's about one person and they'll help you for about a week and then that's it, you're on your own. You still have to market your book if you are published by someone. Yeah. Oh, Unless you're John Grisham. Then all good information. That. All good information. Yeah. That's brilliant. I will pass that on. He's a stunt man, by the way. So it's, oh, it's a whole, yeah, it's the whole kind of uh, stunt thing. Well, um, like that, that that you know that's sexier than book than I'm ever going to write. So maybe he does go. You know, if he's got stories to tell. And oh, he he's certainly got, has. And, and if he's willing to tell them, well, then a publisher might be the way to go. But I'd certainly be uh, reading Joanna Penn's stuff. That, I will. I will Regardless. certainly pass that, that pass that information on. That is brilliant. Um, well, I, we've been talking for an hour now, Trevor. I can't believe it. And I, there's so much more that I want to talk to you about, like your own Australian crime novel. That's you know, this is a, a, an ambition you have yourself. Yeah, still an ambition. <laughs> still an ambition. Um, yeah, it's uh, slowly but surely I've, I've started it probably 30 times. I've got what I'm very good at is creating characters. I create a lot of characters and then I've got to weave them together. And then, go, then I've got too many characters and I'm going to scrap it and start again. But uh, yeah, I'd love to do more on the fiction side. Um, it just needs time and space. It really does. And you've almost got to treat it like a job, um, as Joanna Penn will say, you know, set time aside and just do it. Uh, and that's not happening at the moment because my writing, I set time aside to do my writing for my own content. So this is a secondary thing. So um, it's something that I probably have to do after hours a bit more. But uh, look, it nev it's never gone away. It's always been there. Um, I've written scripts. So I've done all that. And, uh, and I think, you know, now the the self-publishing world has changed. I think getting, um, doing that is going to be a good thing. And, uh, but it's a, it's still probably a long time off, but I love the idea of it. I always see ideas. Doesn't matter every time I go out, oh, that's a good name. Or I could, I could, uh, you know, there's so many, there's too many ideas. So yeah. the matter is finding the one that will really grab you, that will keep you interested over the journey to do it. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like maybe it's something in retirement. You know, that's that's a horrible thought, isn't it? To kind of put it to that shocking, that shocking thought. <laughs> um, it will be, yeah. That will be the next evolution. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Evolution is the thing. Do you think writing a book has actually opened doors for you, though, as a speaker and given you that sort of credibility? Yeah, it has. It has. Um, it just has. It's just a, um, you know, I, I, I know many instances. Sometimes when you, you someone asks you to speak at something and you meet them and find out there's got to be a right fit there, I think. Um, very rare. They'll just pick you and nothing happens. I mean, unless you're a, a really big time super keynote speaker. But for most speaking gigs, particularly around business, they'll, you know, you want to talk to them first. And and they might, they might have others in mind. Sometimes, often they do. And you go in and talk to them and send them a book or give them a book. And it kind of elevates you at that next layer up. It's not necessarily the kicker, but it certainly doesn't do you any harm. And I think what the book does is it codifies your thinking that then goes off into other things. So um, it, it, it does add that layer of credibility, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. And... Uh, but I think more than anything, it's really, as you say, it's it shows that you've done it and you've put the effort in to think about it. So whether you are or not ahead of the game doesn't really matter. Perception-wise, you are. Yeah. Yeah. So do you recommend people start with a newsletter? <laughs> is, that a, is that a good place <laughs> Look, to start? Look, well, blogging. If you want your blogging, but... I think, you know, a blog, even if you're going to have a podcast or YouTube, you still need a blog. I think you need a home base. That's your home yeah. base. Um, I think the whole notion around newsletter, it's a really great, if you can build an, a, an audience via a new, an opt-in newsletter um, or a subscriber through podcasting or whatever, at least that's kind of, you, but you don't know who those subscribers are. At least with a newsletter, you know who they are and you can, you know, you can build a relationship with people. Uh, because it's still quite sacred, the inbox. And and the problem is if you build that audience on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you, you know, you'll lose control. You have no control. 
you have no control. And as, far, as we know with Facebook, they'll strangle the organic reach and then you're in a power of hurt. So I like the idea of an opt-in email, whether it's a newsletter or not, whether you call it a newsletter or not, but we see from Mark and you are the media, it's a very effective tool, but you've got to show up. You've got to show up regularly for it to really, really work. Yeah. So I, lo I like the idea, um, but it's got to be like everything. It's got to be sharp. Um, it's got to stand for something. It can't be just a, a lot of generality. Yeah. And yours is called Reputation Revolution, which is yeah. the same as the podcast. So yeah, it it's yeah, that's right. So that, that the whole thing is around. It's it's kind of like the professional personal branding show. Um, you know, your reputation is pretty much all you've got today. So why wouldn't you want to, you know, build that brand and that reputation over time? And that will carry you through. That's your your asset, whether you work for someone else or. Uh, even if you work for someone else, that's probably the riskiest place to be uh, because if you've got your own brand, well, then when you walk away, at least that you carry that with you. So I think that, that it, that's really important. So the, the podcast was all about that and now the, the, uh, the newsletter on Substack, so it's reputationrevolution.substack.com, that is the adjunct to it. So it's kind of like the bookends, yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, it's been fantastic talking to you today, Trevor. And we haven't even covered covered neighbours. I've got, I've got a list of things up here. that I, Publicity team for neighbours gone very, very quickly because I, I actually remember watching the first episode of Neighbours many, many years ago. And now it's, <laughs> now it's ended. It's ending. It's ending because in England they're cutting it. So, you know, yeah. it's, uh, I, think, I think it's been going well in, because England has been supporting it for so so many years but yeah I was uh, I worked for a TV network in the uh, in the early days of Neighbours and I was there on I think my first week there was kind of Kylie's wedding so that'll ah. give you a bit of a flavour for when I was there so it was um, I was you know it was the, the signature program for the for the network and and all hands on deck around neighbours but I had my other shows as well but I did do a 12 month stint in in, in uh, TV publicity and hung with the stars but uh, all good came yeah. from, came at that from a, a journalism background so it was a lot of fun so the publicity for that though, that you were doing was that was that written stuff or was it yeah it was all publicity for press really press and radio interviews mainly um, it's hard to get TV interviews from other TV stations um, it was mainly press stories yeah. yeah whether it was interviews in magaz magazines and newspapers was the key yeah um, and and um, yeah the on the individuals or the characters and what's coming up and all that sort yeah. of stuff and oh, I was just one of the of the team there were people who are pretty much on it full time yeah oh well rest in peace neighbors I should, indeed, yeah. indeed. Not, that, not that i've watched it probably for for quite a while but yeah I think <laughs> you miss it. Uh, well thank you so much for your time today where can people find you i've got a couple of uh of of uh links here but i don't know whether this is i this reckon is your yeah tre trevoryoung.me is my website um probably the easiest one for people to remember is trevor.world <laughs> if you punch trevor.world in up it comes with uh, all the links uh, and now this is the this one is your podcast so that's reputation revolution podcast yep yep if you go reputation revolution dot dot co will be the podcast yeah and then whoa <laughs> that's the podcast again sorry let's hide one quickly for those of you that are just listening then you won't have seen that mistake yeah Tre trevor.world will get you everywhere excellent excellent i will enjoy the rest of your evening thank you uh, yeah, thank you thanks very much for your time yeah no it's been it's been great talking to you and hopefully i'll see you on a you are the media screen very soon hopefully you never know you never yeah know. no plans <laughs> no plans to visit the seaside mark schaefer style Oh, uh, look, I was. I was pinned down there for 2020. I was coming in May 2020. Oh. And, uh, of course, COVID put the end of that. And then we said, oh, well, maybe at the end of the year. And that never happened. And, uh, yeah, so I was, you know, I've been down there before um, in 2018, 2019, I think. Start of 2019. And, uh, yes, 2020 was it. But next time I'm over there, I was planning to go over next year. And, uh, yeah, definitely drop into the Bournemouth area. Brilliant. Well, I might get to meet you in person. Absolutely. But until then, have fun and, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Bye.